Portland's wall of moms crumbles as a Black Lives Matter group accuses them of anti-blackness. In this video, we're going to take a look at the latest example of the far left eating themselves and why we can expect to see that such self-destruction on the new woke left is only just beginning. You're not going to want to miss this. Greetings, everyone. Patriots all across the globe. Dr. Steve here with you. Great to be with you as always. If this is your first time here on this channel, a very warm welcome to you. We post two videos a day analyzing current events, analyze some super awesome conservative trends so we can all live in the present in light of even better things to come. So if you haven't already done so, you know what to do. Make sure to smack that bell and subscribe button. We'd love to have you as a regular part of this channel where each and every day we together celebrate, yes, the inevitable collapse of left-wing globalism and the unstoppable rise of a new conservative age. Now, before we dive in here, have you seen gold and silver lately? Gold just made history. It hit a record high of over $1,900 an ounce, and Bloomberg says it'll zoom past 2000 sooner than expected. In fact, Bank of America said it'll get to 3000 in just the next 18 months. The billionaire Thomas Kaplan predicted a new decade-long bull market that'll push gold past $5,000 an ounce. If you're sick of low returns and volatility from the market, it is time to look at gold and silver. And that is where our good friends over at Noble Gold come in. There's never been a better time to start a gold or silver IRA in your portfolio. And the amazing staff over at Noble Gold are ready to help you in any way that they can. And you may even get a five ounce America the Beautiful silver bullion coin in the process. So do not wait. Click on that link below or visit their website at noblegoldinvestments.com or give them a call at 877-646-5347. Make sure to mention my name, Dr. Steve Turley, and let's ride that gold wave together. All right, gang, let's dive right in here. My, oh my. <laughs> You can't make this stuff up. I am frankly, I never cease to be amazed in the way, various ways in which the far left destroys itself. And let's look at the latest example, shall we? It involves a so-called wall of moms, or better, the wall of woke moms. You probably heard about this. In Portland, which, by the way, seems to have, uh, the, the demonstrations there seem to have completely fizzled. I don't know if you've seen this, but this past weekend protest only drew a few hundred demonstrators. So it looks like after the feds came in and cracked down and instituted mass incarcerations, it just looks like they've begun to fizzle. But in the midst of the height of the federal crackdown of the last couple of weeks, you had a bunch of woke women who called themselves the Wall of Moms. It had to have been one of the more, frankly, you know, cringeworthy, ridiculous developments in the whole Portland Marxist joke of an uprising. And it's where you had a bunch of middle-aged women attending the demonstrations and standing around the protesters with locked arms forming a human shield between the protesters and the federal officers. And again, true to form, you have the leftist activists disguised as journalists in the mainstream Marxist media lauding these women as paragons of virtue and warriors of wokeness. Again, I mean, it's just so cringeworthy at this point. No one, no one takes these so-called reporters seriously anymore. The puff piece propaganda is just so patently obvious. Well, now, as it turns out, <laughs> even the wall of moms is not immune from the scorn of Black Lives Matter activists. Even the wall of moms, which just a couple of weeks ago was untouchable. They were like Greta Thunberg. They were beyond reproach. Well, now even the wall of moms is drowning under the waves of wokeness. As it turns out, the group's white leaders... <laughs> the group's white leaders have been accused of failing to protect black women in the protests. Now, I kid you not, all right? I know this is all too predictable. We'll get into that in a minute as to why. But in an Instagram post, a group called Don't Shoot Portland, a local Black Lives Matter group, which is a local Black Lives Matter group that's been around since 2014, they said that they're no longer supporting the wall of moms. They're, they're done. And uh, this Don't Shoot Portland, they originally took issue with the group's all-white leadership. The, the Wall of Moms leadership was made up solely of white women, and that's a problem, okay? And so under pressure, these white women announced last week that they're all stepping down so that black women could take over. 
I'm sorry. I'm going to get through this. But that wasn't good enough because, as it turns out, the founder of the Wall of Moms is a lady by the name of Bev Barnum. She apparently went behind the backs of this new black leadership and she filed for business registrations for the organization seeking to turn it into a nonprofit. So they, of course, could start funneling money into the coffers of Democrat politicians. Moreover, the group was accused of not protecting black women during the demonstrations. And so these two factors, the business dealings behind the backs of the organization's new black leadership and the organization's failure to protect black women during the protests has caused Don't Shoot to call on all BLM activists to stop supporting Wall of Moms. You literally can't make this stuff up. Now, make no mistake, this is ultimately the logical end of the kind of ethnocentric reasoning that characterizes BLM. Again, if you're a regular on this channel, you know that we're not so much interested in the particular grievances of Black Lives Matter. Um, I think those change a lot. Um, I'm not particularly interested in their grievances. Although, of course, uh, if they're blatantly, flat out, factually egregious, like the notion that blacks are disproportionately killed more by police than whites, uh, which is emphatically not true. You have black scholars who fully recognize that. That's we'll, we'll take that on. But instead, our interest on this channel has been on the ways in which their grievances are voiced and communicated and couched in what we would call highly ethnocentric reasoning and rhetoric. And what's so interesting here is that rhetorical studies have found that the rhetoric of Martin Luther King in the 1960s, for example, that was a rhetoric that was highly unifying in that the grievances of blacks back then were resolved, or at least they were claimed that they would be resolved in terms of their full assimilation to the ideals of the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution. So if you read through the I Have a Dream speech, it's a speech that never calls into question the ideals of America as understood by the Founding Fathers. It rather called into question how those ideals are being applied, you know, in unequal ways. And this, for lack of a better term, is the rhetoric of civic nationalism, where a polyethnic society comes together and finds its unity in its founding principles and ideals that transcend any particular ethnicity. Now, all nations have some kind of ethnic root or history, but the ethnocultural tradition ends up transcending that ethnic group and invites others to participate in its ideals. We have that in Russia, for example. Uh, Russia has over 100 different ethnicities that find their uni unity in a unique sense of Russianness. So the important point here is that if you read through the I Have a Dream speech, the American ideals, the ideals of the Founding Fathers, were never themselves called into question. Today, the rhetoric coming out of the BLM movement actually calls into question many of those ideals of our founding fathers as inconsistent with distinctively black ethnocultural sentiments. And so the rhetoric today that we hear from BLM activists is highly ethnocentric. And what we're interested in on this channel is not only what's behind this turn to ethnocentricity, which I've argued is the collapse of modern liberalism and the return to nation, culture, custom, tradition, and yes, race and ethnicity among the world's population as a whole. We're not only interested in what's behind this turn to ethnocentric reasoning, but more importantly, we're interested in where is it all going? Now that the Democratic Party and the left-wing activists disguised as journalists in the mainstream Marxist media, now that they have embraced ethnocentric reasoning, now that they've embraced blatant tribalism, right? Now that they've embraced blatant ethno-nationalism, where is this all going? Because I would argue that, as Professor Carol Swain is so well demonstrated in her work on ethnocentric reasoning, once ethnocentric reasoning has been validated in a society, it is no longer a one-way street. Once ethnocentricity is let loose, right, in society, um, it becomes central to the national ethos. And when you have a poly-ethnic nation that unleashes competing ethnocentric concerns and loyalties and fidelities, there is simply no way that a poly-ethnic nation can hold together. And that's precisely what we're seeing here with the Wall of Moms movement, right? It's a microcosm. The movement couldn't hold together 
precisely because it imploded under the weight of competing ethnocentric concerns. And this is why you can always, always, always be sure that the new left, the ethnocentric left, which is not really left, but is far more akin to the ethno-nationalism of the alt-right, but regardless, this is why you can always bank on the fact that the new left is going to kill itself. It's ultimately in a war with itself. And that's because the new left is made up of these competing ethnocentricities. It's made up of a coalition of minority ethnic groups or grievance groups as a whole, like feminists, right? And the ethnic groups among the coalition of the aggrieved are increasingly going tribal. They're increasingly turning inward for answers and direction and advocacy. And as such, we're beginning to see the other groups, they're beginning to see the other groups within their so-called coalition, coalitions every bit as a hostile threat as a white male or as a Republican or as a conservative. So this is why you're having the civil war between Nancy Pelosi and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who accuses Pelosi of racism because she supposedly only criticizes women of color. This is what's going on with Rashida Tlaib and why she will not endorse Joe Biden. This is what's going on with Black Lives Matter activists now beginning to attack what they're calling liberal white supremacists, right? So you have Black Lives Matter activists coming out and saying explicitly that just because we're both leftist liberals doesn't mean that we are on the same political side. You may be a liberal, but if you're the wrong color, you could be every bit the threat to me as Donald Trump supposedly is, right? That's precisely what you get when you turn to ethnocentric reasoning in a polyethnic nation. You inevitably balkanize. There's just no way around that. You inevitably crack up. Now, some people may welcome that balkanization. Clearly, some of the more militant black nationalists have no problem with it. The alt-right has no problem with it. They frankly advocate for it. But the important point here for this video is that the implosion of the wall of moms is precisely the kind of disillusion and fission that we can expect with ethnocentric loyalties become all pervasive in a polyethnic context. You just can't win, right? So here you have an organization, the Wall of Moms, with an all-white leadership, and in the context of a new left where ethnocentric reasonings are going haywire, you're inevitably going to be seen as symptomatic of the very white supremacist system, the supposed white supremacist system that you're all supposed to be fighting against. And so these white moms, this white leadership, find itself every bit the object of scorn and derision that President Trump has become among these people. It's really, <laughs> it's a fascinating development. And this, I would argue, uh, um, this is why I would argue that in a polyethnic context, a new ethnocentric left will always end up destroying itself. It will always end up balkanizing within its own context before it can fully balkanize the larger macro-national context. So that's why you can always count on the new woke left to defeat itself. It is indeed the gift that keeps on giving. Now, before you go, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And you'll definitely want to check out my latest video I just uploaded on the Trump poll surge. Have you been seeing these? It's happening. President Trump's poll numbers are indeed surging everywhere, just as the Biden campaign is showing signs of a total meltdown. It's going to absolutely make your day. So make sure to click on the link and I will see you over there. God bless.